you know, it blesses me to see people grabbing hold of this, this word that the Lord gave us. And uh, one of the things that I've done uh, after I received this word is when, when you receive bad news, and it, you know, it, it might not be terrible news, but it's any news that doesn't agree with what the word of God says. I have adopted a habit. When I hear bad news or something that's said that, you know, doesn't agree with what God said can happen, I just do this. I just go, <laughs> you know what that means? That means an explosion of God's uh, influence on that situation. Somebody says, well, you know, so-and-so is doing this. I just go, Pow. that went over real well. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it means a lot to me. So I just, psh, you know, so maybe I can teach you to. <laughs> so we've already had many blessing explosions. And, you know, when it says, um, get ready for your blessing explosion, I should have put an S on that because it's explosion after explosion after explosion. Widespread in its influence. That's the definition of explosion. Well, today, uh, I'm going to get through this as quick as I can, but I've got a long way to go. And um, um, so if you're taking notes, you might want to sharpen your pencil up good. If you uh, need a title to write down with your notes, I'm calling this the explosive imagination of the dreamer. The explosive imagination of the dreamer. Now, I'm going to approach faith in a, in a, in a little different uh, manner with, with what I say, but nothing has changed. Uh, it, it's still, you know, you, you hear the old term, uh, seeing is believing. And, you know, we as Christians say, well, believing is seeing. Uh, no, the, the truth of it is, when you, when you understand what I'm going to be talking about this morning, uh, seeing is believing. It depends on which level you're seeing from. Now that I've got your attention, listen to me. <laughs> when you see it, you believe it. And that's the key to believing with the heart, is to see it. And you're designed to believe what you see. We're made that way. It's true in the natural, and we're conditioned to it. So in the natural realm, if you see something, you believe it. Why do you believe it? Because I see it. There's a train coming down the track, and I'm in the middle of the track. I believe that. <laughs> so what do you do? You get out of the way. But you don't have to believe it if you don't see it. So if there's no train coming, you don't believe it because you don't see it. So in the natural, we are designed to believe what we see. And that's a good thing in the natural realm. But we as believers are also designed first to live and operate in the spirit realm. And my challenge to you this year is to get your thinking where you think and speak and believe from the light line over and dominant over the natural things that occur and circumstances that are created in this natural world. When you begin to See from that realm, everything changes. And so what I want to do this year is, is in everything that we do, is help you to get into that level. Because that's where we're supposed to operate. Yes. And the problem with the whole thing is, we usually operate from this natural level, and we react according to what we see in the natural realm, and that's what we believe, so we walk our life out according to what the natural realm is. 
And you can never get to the things of God if you operate in that realm and not from the realm that God has placed you. See, Paul says we're seated in heavenly places. I mean, he's trying to get us to understand we're above. We have authority. We have dominion. That's above circumstances. So uh, we're to live in the spirit realm. We're to live and operate from that realm, which is as it's, it's a greater reality because we have to dominate the natural realm from within the spirit realm where we've been designed by God to live and operate. See, that's why things go awry. God didn't design us to operate according to the natural realm. Amen. Amen. Stay with me now. So that's why I say if you can see it in your spirit, you can believe it. And if you can believe it, you can have it. So we must learn how to change our perspective. If you can only see trouble, then that's what you believe. But when you change your perspective and begin to view trouble as only an object upon which to exercise the truth of God's word established in your heart, then you only see success and victory. It's not saying that trouble's not there. We're not in denial. We're saying that trouble is no longer a roadblock to my progress. It's just an opportunity for me to put into operation what I really truly believe because I'm operating from the light line. I'm operating from the spirit realm. I am a spirit. You are a spirit. We're to operate in that realm. And you've got to learn to move your perspective up in that area so that you can be successful more and more. In fact, every time if you'll just stay in that place. So uh, Paul operated this way. When you begin to think in that area, that's why he told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, he said, we are hedged in, uh, pressed on every side, troubled and oppressed in every way, but, but. he just stepped up on that level, but, we're not cramped or crushed. We suffer embarrassments and are perplexed and unable to find a way out. See, none of that is untrue, but not driven to despair. Why? Because he's operating from that level of what he truly believes. He's not denying Factual things. You know, somebody can be diagnosed by a physician with a certain disease or condition. That's a fact. That's not the truth. Now, when you begin to think like I'm trying to get you to think, everybody in here will go, amen, and really mean it. It's a fact, but it's not the truth. The truth is what God says in his word. He said, we are pursued, persecuted, hard driven, but he's not operating from that realm. Not deserted to stand alone. Because Jesus said he'd never leave me and forsake me. We, we are struck down to the ground. Sometimes, you know, you just feel like you're prostrate on your face. But He's not operating from that level. So he says, never struck out and destroyed. And then verse 18, he says, while we consider and look not at the things that are seen, and I interjected in there, in the natural realm, but to the things that are not seen. 
And for understanding, I put not seen in the natural realm, but are seen in the spirit realm. For the things that are visible in the natural realm are temporary, brief, and fleeting. Or in other words, not permanent, therefore of no significance. But the things that are invisible in, in the natural realm, but clearly seen in the spirit realm, are deathless and everlasting. So, what God has said to us and what he's made available to us, people in, in the natural realm, they don't see it. That's why they call you cuckoo. They don't see it. Uh, but it is clearly seen in the spirit realm, so those things that are invisible are clearly seen in the spirit realm are deathless and everlasting. In other words, they're full of life-giving substance and overwhelmingly dominant over the natural realm. That's what Paul is saying. See, he's speaking from that realm. He's comparing the two. But he says, no, we don't live down there. We live up here. So if you can see something beyond your poverty, beyond sickness, beyond a stressful situation, whatever the circumstance is, then you can get yourself delivered out of that natural state of undesirable circumstances. And that's, just not, that's not just wishful thinking. This is the way that he describes that we're to live in, in, in this life. See, God is telling us in Isaiah 60, verse 1, and I'm paraphrasing some of this, transliterating it, so you're not going to find it verbatim as this, but it's okay to study it and, and transliterate it. I'm not adding to the word. I'm putting some understanding with what's there. He said, basically, arise, get up from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Look up to your new life in Christ Jesus where my truth, my circumstances have come on you and live in my glory. That's what he's basically saying. Because his power flows through those who believe. Did you get that? Yes. His power flows through those who believe. Now, Satan comes to keep you from dreaming. He comes to keep you from dreaming because he knows if you can see it, you got it. I mean, I remember when Pastor Ann and I, we were searching for a new house. And, uh, well, it was new to us. The first house wasn't a new house, but it was new to us. And we began, and we didn't even know this then. We just began to see us because my boss told me, he, he brought me in his office one day. He was, he was a good boss when I first started with Nationwide. And he said, he said uh, son, let me ask you something. I said, what's that? He said, are you, are you how, how, how are y'all living? Are you renting? Are you buying your house? I said, well, we're renting. We're renting, uh, uh, I think it was an apartment or a duplex or something at that time. He said, Why? I said, well, you know, that's what, that's what we can afford. And he told me this. Now, he wasn't even a Christian, but he was a smart guy. He said, why don't you start seeing yourself in your own house? He said, how much are you paying for rent? And I told him, he said, you can get a nice house for that. I said, well, I don't know if they'll give us a loan. We don't have a whole lot of credit established and everything, you know, because we're just starting out. We're new and everything. He said, look, you don't have to worry about that. If the bank will loan it to you, you can get it. That was back when that's the way it was. They weren't trying to ruin people's lives in their economy. They wouldn't let you buy anything you couldn't afford. 
Well, it had been better to pay cash for the house. Man, we were just trying to buy groceries at that time. We didn't know. And so we started seeing ourselves living in a house. And it wasn't too long. We were living in a house. Nice house. On an acre of land, you know. Nice place. And we didn't even know any of this. But we, he helped me raise my thinking so I could see us in a home gaining equity and some value versus just taking our rent money every month, basically, and lighting it and let, let it burn up. I mean, you nothing to show for it except you had a place to live for a month. Nothing live, wrong with living in an apartment. Nothing at all. But you might want to think, can I do better? And, you know, I, we've lived in some nice apartments. I don't have anything wrong with an apartment. But do you catch the concept? So he keeps you from dreaming. The devil tries to keep you from dreaming because he knows if you can see it, you've got it. Jairus saw it. See, if you go back and read some of these accounts in Jesus' ministry, you'll catch this very easily. He went to Jesus and he said, you just come and lay your hands on my daughter and she'll be healed and live. See, he had heard him preach and he saw it. He didn't see his daughter dead on the bed. He saw his daughter healed and living. And so he put his faith out there. But just like life does, time went by because the lady with the issue of blood comes up. And tells her story, and you know, it's a good story, and it's something that we all need to know and everything. But then I like that part in there where it says, and she told him everything. <laughs> Do you know how long it takes a lady to tell everything? They probably were there for at least two or three hours. Because she told him everything all those years that she had been through. And Jairus is standing there. It's okay, she ain't going to hit you. She knows it's true. And he's just standing there. What I'm telling you, time went by. Time can be your friend or time can be your enemy. Your choice. It's your choice. What are you going to do with it? So time went by, delay. And then on top of that, bad news. The soothsayers come and they say, don't bother the master anymore. I don't need him bothering him or believing in anything. And she did. And Jesus looked at him. And basically he said, you stay with what you see. You see it. Don't be afraid. You just continue to believe. You just continue to see. Because see, he saw it. He saw it to the extent that he went to Jesus. And because of his position in the synagogue, that was not allowed he could have gotten into serious trouble going to Jesus or even talking to him. But he not only went to him, he went and just laid it all out to Jesus. Jesus was basically saying, don't be influenced by what you've seen or just heard. Just keep believing what you saw in the spirit realm when you decided to come to me. And you know the end of the story. His daughter was healed and she lived. So what am I saying? God has given you the ability to be informed on another level. So if I have another level of revelation, I'll have another level of faith. Did you get that? So if I'm at another level of faith, then God's going to deliver something to me that folks that are not on that level will ever get. So you can't go by what folks are saying when you see it. Because if they don't see it, they're not being ugly to you. If they don't see it, they'll say, now wait a minute, that <laughs> you're operating in false hope there. Because they don't see it. And if they don't see it, they can't believe that with you.
you may, I, I, I know Ann, you know, we, we, were, we were trying, at that time we were going to Northwood Assembly and we were building that new big building and, and uh, everybody was g- given a, a slip of paper and said, you know, write down what you want your part to be in paying for this building. And I mean, I, I built walls, I built hung doors and, you know, we had, when we, when that place burned down, a <laughs> part of us burned down with it because we had blood in that, in, in that place. But she, we, we decided to, uh, give what we could. And so she decided to sell her car. We didn't decide to give what we could. We decided to give beyond what we could. That's right. It was beyond what, and what we, we prayed. And he gave you a figure and he gave me a figure and mine was much larger than yours. And you're like, what? So anyway, she, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I was still in the insurance. I knew what her car was worth. Twarn't worth that. And I think she put, what was it, $2,500? Let me preach this. Just tell me the amount. And we sold something else. And uh, no, I don't want to go into piano and what we sold. How much was your car? $2,500. Her car was worth about $1,500, $1,600. But she saw it selling at $2,500. And I started to just tell her. See, I was, I was looking on this level down here. I was looking at the facts. Because in with what I did, I was also an appraiser and dealt with salvage. I mean, I was an expert in this area, Literally. But I started to say something to her about it, and I thought, no, 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 she sees that. Long story short, this woman came by to buy it, and she took it to test drive it, and she ended up coming back with $2,500 in cash in $28 bills. We hadn't seen that much money at one time ever. And I mean, $2,500 in $20 bills spread out on the table. That looks like a lot of money. And right then, it was a lot of money. But you see, she saw it. And I wasn't going, I wasn't going to go against what she saw. And you know what happened? She got it. Because she could see it. She got it. And just listen. Just listen. I got 26 pages here. So if we're late, it's your fault, baby. We're not going to tell all that. We're not going to tell all that. You can preach next Sunday. Listen, so many good things were happening, it's hard for her to hold it back. Because we were having explosion after explosion after explosion. I mean, God was blessing us because we were wanting to bless that ministry and bless that church. And when he gets the idea, it's like this first fruits offering. When God gets the idea that you're going to give extra and honor him so that he can honor you for the rest of the year, man, that's he just jumps all over that. And we were blessed here, and we were blessed there, and blessed here, and blessed there. And, and it's hard. I know, you know, I'm messing with Ann right now. She knows that. But it's hard to hold all that back because it was just blessing after blessing. Now, uh, why does Satan want to stop your imagination? Because your imagination tears down the walls of your natural mind. So your natural mind has walls, limitations. And if he can get you, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 calls that uh, strongholds, but those are walls. And if, and, and because if, if your imagination tears down the walls in your natural mind, uh, your imagination creates unlimited possibilities. Have you ever imagined anything? I mean, just sit there and imagine now, I mean, you know, it, it may not be something that you went through with, but if you ever imagine, I have in the middle of the winter when it's cold and it's messy, kind of yucky like it was this morning, I've imagined myself on a beach somewhere in the Caribbean. <sighs> Just sitting there with a the breeze, listening to the water lap up on the sand, sitting there at Tortola. Before the storm. I can imagine that. And see, you were imagining with me. You just about saw, you just about saw what I saw. That's your imagination. There's nothing wrong with that. 
The imagination is a powerful thing. It can be powerful in a good way. It can be powerful in a bad way. I used to have an imagination of darkness. I would not take the trash out at night because I knew that there were boogers in the dark. I imagined them eating me if I took the trash out. And I told my mom, you can hit me, kill me, restrict me. I'm not going out at night. You want the garbage taken out, tell me in the daytime and I'll go. But I'm not going at night. And I wouldn't. And for years, I imagined that if I ever went out in the dark, something's going to eat me up. It was strong. So your imagination is powerful. But used in the way that God designed for you to use it, it's unlimited. And it'll always produce. Remember at the Tower of Babel in Genesis eleven six, the Lord said, Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. The Amplified says, Nothing will be impossible for them. He had to intervene. And that's what the world, this natural realm, is using right now. You've got to see yourself operating from this higher level. Keep your imagination, but use it to imagine what God has said and has prepared for you that you can have. Amen? Are you with me? See, God sees you there. That's how you can get there. He sees you there. In Isaiah 43, 26, he, he says, put me in remembrance, remind me of your merits. Or remind me of what you have available. It wasn't that he didn't know. He wanted you to get aware of it. To imagine what he had said about you. He was basically saying, tell me what I've said about you. See yourself on the level of authority above the natural world and seated together with Christ in heavenly places which God prepared for you before time and now has ready for you to walk in. <clears throat> We're in that time. It's blessing explosion time. Hallelujah. Can you do this with me? Yes. <laughs> it's time to see yourself on a level of faith and believing that like you've never seen before. That's, that's what it says. Blessing like you've never seen before. I've seen blessing. But this is a year where it's explosive you'll see things that you hadn't seen before. But see, Satan doesn't want you to see it. So Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. He says, for we walk in the flesh, down in this natural world. We don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, human down here, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds or walls. Our weapons are the word of God that pulls down mental limitations where you say that you're limited. And then he says, casting down, my new King James says arguments, the King James says imaginations, casting down imaginations or arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's what his job is. To exalt what he is trying to get you to see above what God is trying to get you to see. Therein is the warfare. The New Living uh, Translation uh, uh, says, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. The message translation says right there, we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God. And then it continues in verse 5 and says, we are to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ or the word of God. So he tells us what we have to do. And you've got to cast that lying, vain imagination down. You have to cast it down. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not, I'm not smart enough to do this. I'm not smart enough to do that. You've got to cast that down because you have the mind of Christ. That has got to exalt. Either you do or you don't. Well, the Bible says you do. 
And you need to see that. See, the devil knows if you can see it, God will deliver it. You got that? If you can see it, God will deliver it. So the only fight that you'll have in the whole thing is a good fight of faith. That's what Paul says. And the fight of faith is not fighting people. And it's not fighting the devil. He's defeated. So I can set you free this morning by just telling you, you don't, see a lot of you have been fighting the devil. He's defeated. You don't even have to believe anything he says. Because he's a liar. Jesus said he's the father of lies. In other words, he's the biggest liar there ever was. The faith fight, this is prophetic. The faith fight is fighting to maintain your sight. That's the faith fight. Fighting to maintain your sight. What? Yeah, this is your year. The year of your blessing explosions. And again, I go, <laughs> shock and awe on the devil. Amen. Shock and awe. Shout that with me. Shock and awe. Shock and awe. He won't know what hit him. Joel 2.28 says, and it shall come to pass afterward. Well, see, we're in afterward now, okay? Because all that's happened. We're, af we're in afterward. That I will pour out my spirit, because he did. On all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. All of those three things are affecting your imagination. What do you have in your spirit that is deposited in your spirit that allows you to see the things that God wants you to see? Well, his word. You have to get it established in your heart. Replace it, re replace those other things with what his word says about it. Saints, we're, we're about to be some big dreamers and let those dreams <laughs> just explode. And and, and these dreams will spread in a wide pattern all around you, like Bridget shared with us earlier. Your imagination is designed to take you past the limits that Satan has tried to set up in your life. Do you get that? You can see yourself out of lack. You can see yourself operating at the top of your field. You can see yourself in a new car, a new house. You can see yourself with a full bank account. Now, people thinking in the natural think, oh, that's heresy. That's that. No, that's just, that's mind over matter. No, that's word over what the devil wants you to believe. It's in here. It's in there. You can see yourself and I'll just quote the word with it. You can see yourself in a position to, as it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, you can see yourself in a position to be able under all circumstances and whatever the need, be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. That's how you're to see yourself. How far can you see? That's the question. How far can you see? See, God's not restricting you. And that's what makes you like God. He has no restrictions on blessing, and we're not to have any on blessing either. See, people have been told too long, and unfortunately by the church, that you're just supposed to be marginal, just, you know, just going along, not really supposed to have much. And for God's sake, no new car for the pastor. Are you kidding? 
God, you keep him poor, and we'll keep him humble. That's the church. That's that's been the church's attitude. You don't believe me? You just go out in some of these denominational places, and I know I've been into a lot of them, and I was a member of some of them, and I was on the board of three of them, and that's exactly the way they think. But that's not the way God thinks. And so, for some that have been in that same situation, you've got to pull out of that and get on that other level. God wants you to be blessed as much as you will allow it. As much as you see yourself in it. And the more of his word of his blessing that you place in your heart and renew your mind with it, to that extent that you see that, you will walk in it. Amen. See, that's why socialism is trying to flood its way in their country. Because we are a country that is under God and based on godly principles. And socialism is exactly opposite of that. Uh, It says you can't achieve because if you achieve, we'll take what you achieved, we'll level it out so everybody gets the same. We'll accept the ones that are saying that you're supposed to live that way. They're totalitarian and they're going to have it all. They're going to be worth millions and billions and trillions. But socialism says, no, you can't achieve beyond what we say you can achieve. And we'll take care of you. We'll give you everything you need. Hockey puck, that is not the way that works. That's a devilish, devilish doctrine. And, and it's why it's never worked anyway. But see, it's just the opposite of, of what I'm saying. It, what it does, it restricts your ability to excel. And God takes the restrictions off. And as long as you have the restrictions off, you cannot be dominated. And socialism wants to dominate you. God wants you to be the dominator. And so you've got, in the world, you've got that constant input of that. So you've got to see above that. Amen. And it's a plan to penalize dreamers. But see, this is the process by which God taught Joshua and us to believe. There's a verse of scripture in the Bible that God used to teach Joshua, and it's the same one, to teach us how to prosper. It's found in Joshua 1.8. He said, this book of the law, we can now say the word of God. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night that you may observe to do or be obedient to serve is what that means, the word. You may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then... You shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall deal wisely and have good success. Have you got that up there? Every time you see you or yours, your, I want you to put your name in there. Let's read that together. This book of the law shall not depart out of Mike's mouth, but Mike shall meditate on it day and night, that Mike may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then Mike shall make Mike's way prosperous, and then Mike shall deal wisely and have good success. God God said that. God said that. I didn't say that. God said that. See, you're not waiting on God. You're waiting on yourself. God's already done it. God's already made it available. He's already said it. He's already taken the restrictions off. The last of any restrictions that he would have ever had took off last year. Because it was the year of the great outpouring of the limitless power of God. Explosions. Revelation. (laughs) Just go on this journey with me. Let's go this way this year. 
See, a, a, a very powerful key is when you see it and put it in your heart, you believe it. And when you believe it, Jesus said, you will receive it. In Mark 11, he said, you will receive it. So we may see and believe. See and believe. See and believe. See and believe. But see, we know what we're saying when we say see and believe. We're not down here, we're up here. You are designed to believe what you see. That's just a natural truth. Before you ever th- know, knew anything about the Lord. I mean, you see a hot fire in the fireplace, you believe that you ain't going to get in it. So seeing and believing is, is very real. But then you take it on that spiritual level where we are to live as speaking spirits. And you have to begin to see yourself living on that light line. Do you see yourself living on the light line? If you can see beyond the trouble, then your faith will deliver you through the trouble. The biblical term for that is breakthrough. <laughs> You're going to see me doing a lot. Of I may be walking down the hall. You don't know what I'm thinking about, but all of a sudden I'll go. I just went through something and won. Because his power and it's explosive. God's power is explosive. His power flows through those who believe. I said it a while ago. I'll say it again. David was a dreamer. You remember all the accounts of David and everything he went through? He was, he was a dreamer. In fact, there's a, I've mentioned this recently. There's a book. It came out a number of years ago. It's called The Fourth Dimension by Dr. Uh, Yanji Cho. Uh, you can, I think you can get it online. I had a copy. I hadn't been able to find mine, but I've been looking for it. But uh, uh, in that book, uh, Dr. Cho mentioned the studies of a neurosurgeon. And uh, I'm going to read some of the things verbatim that that neurosurgeon said. These were findings that they got... And they weren't necessarily Christians. They were just New York surgeons putting together facts and, and, and so forth. And so just because you're older, keep dreaming. Don't just sit on the front porch and rock until you die. I'm, I've known people that have done it. You know, they get out of business and they go sit on the front porch and they just wait. And it'll work. You can break down and die early if that's what you want to do. But just because you're older, keep dreaming. Dreaming is the key to your mental and spiritual health. I just said something very important and hot off the press. But the neuro, neurosurgeon report said, one of the things he said in there was, it's amazing that what people say is what the nervous system picks up and it begins to do do that in their body, in their lives. That's why you've got to watch what you say. Now, how are we going to enjoy the blessing explosion? Wasn't it emphasized in the prophecy by a parade of words? A parade of words. Example, he said, people who were saying things They got them because you were never designed to say what you didn't want. This is a neurosurgeon just doing a study. James 3, 2, for instance, says, for in many things we offend. If anyone, if any man offends not in word, what he says, what he speaks, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. In other words, you say the right word, you can control your whole body. The, James said that. That's in the Bible. The Amplified says he's able to curb his entire nature. So don't be saying, oh, I can't do that. I can't change. 
I am just the way I am. Well, change. You can do it. But it takes you to do it. Nobody can change you but you. Your words were designed to control your body. That's why we're the only speaking spirit that exists. Proverbs 30, 32 says this. If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have, uh, if you have devised evil, put your hand over your mouth. You see that? Because what you devise, you're going to speak. What you have been thinking about, you're going to speak. But the neurosurgeon continued and he said, the speech center rules over all the nerves, every nerve in your body, the speech center. Did you know that? This is a neurosurgeon. He said, the speech center rules over all the nerves, and as a result of that, according to our findings in neurology, the speech center in the brain has total dominion over all of the nerves. That's why you can just blab out and say something, and you get mad all over, and you'll just shake, because it controls the nerves, every part of your body. He went on to say, he said, the speech nerve center has such power over all the body that simply speaking can give one control over his body to manipulate it in any way he wishes. Someone says, I'm going to become weak right away. All the nerves receive that message and they say, well, let's prepare to become weak. We received instructions from our central command of communication that we should become weak. So they then, in natural sequence, start to adjust themselves for physical weak attitude and weakness. Someone says, I have no ability. I can't do that job. Right away, the nerve endings begin to acknowledge it And we receive instructions from the central nervous system saying we have no ability and we are to give up and stop striving to develop anymore. Even saying, (laughs) I'm retired, they begin to relax and so forth and so on. So we've got to figure out another way to say retired. Well, Ann and I did. People ask us, they say, you work anymore? I said, we're, we're refired. Are you, they'll say, are you retired? I said, no, we're refired. We're refired. Government thinks we're retired, but we're refired. Amen. So, uh, the point is, when you have a wrong thought, put your hand over your mouth. Because your next move is to say what you think. Well, I'll tell you what I think. Maybe not. And what you think is what you believe over what somebody will tell you that in writing and hard print is the absolute truth of it. But what you think, you'll believe over what they think. So you have to change what you think. And if Satan has giving you what to think and you say what Satan says, he'll back it up. God will back his word up with Satan will back up what you believe that he says that you should say. You see why in the prophecy it was capitalized parade of words? Do you, do, do you remember what it said? Let me just read the sentence. And we'll we'll continue on and finish up. We're almost through. He said, so it's not a time to quit. No, it's not a time to lose out. No, it's time to stay with it and advance beyond just survive and enter into explosive blessing of thrive. It's time to flourish and grow luxuriously and spread out in an explosive manner by way of a parade of words. 
your words is what's going to bring this blessing explosion in your life. Because you believe what you say. And if you start saying the right things, then you're going to flow along with what God has for you this year. So if you say what the devil wants you to say, he'll back it up. But if you're thinking from a higher level and God gives you what to think and you say something that men don't understand, which you probably will, but God backs it up. You can change your whole environment. Did you get that? <laughs> if you get that, it's, it'll be explosive with you. Say amen to that. Amen. Speech changed the woman with the issue of blood, for she said. Speech changed that. Speech changed Lazarus' situation. He said to Jesus, you come lay your hands on her, she'll be healed and she'll live. Uh, speech changed the ten lepers. If you will, you can heal me. Jesus said, I will. And they were healed. Speech, 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 speech. Say with me, speech. Speech. What kind of explosion do you want? Jesus said, whoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea. And does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he say will come to pass. He'll have whatever he says. Whatever he says. What you will have whatever you say. And believe in your heart. See, God is waiting on your speech. As I said earlier, David was a dreamer. And he believed that God would enable him. He believed that God would give him the power to kill lions. So you know what he did? He killed lions. He believed that God gave him the power. Now David was not all that big. To kill bears. And what did he do? He killed bears. He believed that God gave him the ability to kill a giant. And what did he do? He killed a giant. And he said, and your whole army. See, the, the wonderful thing about David, if you, if you study out the history of that account, he had five rocks. That was for Goliath and his four brothers. Those four rocks were for a purpose. It wasn't because he's going to miss the first time. He fully in, intended to take all five of them out. But you remember, see, this is the way God thinks. But if you remember, if you go over there and uh, I think it's, what is it, 2 Kings 17, somewhere around there. David said, this day. He didn't say, now, when we get a good night's sleep and tomorrow, because they'd been going to sleep, waking up, going to sleep, going and yelling at each other and all this kind of stuff. David said, no, 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 no. This day, I'm going to take you down. And this day, I'm going to take your head. And this day, we're going to wipe out your whole army. Amen. When? This day. this day. Say with me, this day. this day. See, your victory doesn't have to drag out. Say this day. this day. And if you don't say it, God can't do it. He's waiting on you to say it. But if you see it in the word and you dare to dream and speak it, you can have it. Say amen to that. Amen. Say if I can see it and believe it, I can have it. Say it again. If I can see it, I believe it, and I can have it. Now, I'll say what Brother Copeland said. If you believe this, uh, it'll work for you. If you don't, it won't. Good night. Amen. I'm finished. You take this and chew this up, and I can promise you, you will have an explosive year like you've never had before. 
Why? Because God said it and God prepared it and God has it ready. Don't allow trouble to dominate you. But you speak the word and you'll have a breakthrough. That's from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's stand together.